But no guarantee. <laughs> Good morning all. Kay and I have been talking the last week or so. She's getting ready for a get together of the kids, kids, guys she went to school with. And we've started talking about things past, you know. We're, we're thinking of what we were like when we were kids. And wondering things about I always ask about, well, you, you've got a cousin, Bobby, who's his mama, you know, how are they related? And she says, I wish I'd asked my grandma a long time ago a lot of things. So this is something for anybody here who's under the discount age at Galaxy and Bilo, <laughs> for the, the, the non-geezers among us, especially the young folks. Ask your parents, talk to your grandma, talk to your grandpa, Find out your family history. Someday you'll want to know this. I, I do now. I'd love to know some things about my family. Probably some things I wouldn't want to know. <laughs> but I'd like to know some history. And in my generation, it's all gone. I'm the rim, in what I would say my generation, my first cousins, with the exception of maybe one, have gone on to glory. I'm the only one left, and there's nobody to ask these things. So that's for the kids. I worked in a nursing home for 15 years. I took care of people in the back of an ambulance for 15 years, and most of them were elderly. And I learned something with about every patient I took care of. You just listen to the, listen to the older people. It may seem unimportant now, or you may think, well, they don't know what they're talking about. Trust me, down the road, someday you'll remember some little detail or something your grandma did or something your Uncle Bill did that will help you do something that you need to do then. I've done this many a time thinking back, well, what would my dad have done here? And it works, other than the fact of being a pack rat. <laughs> but that's another story. But by the same token, those of us in our generation, my generation, need to listen to the young folks because we can learn so much from the new technologies that they have. So it's just a matter of interacting with those around you. And that's a very important thing. I think it's just a, a life lesson, you know. And I've learned it the hard way sometimes. I should have listened to a lot of things that when I was 50 years ago, but I didn't. But now I'm wishing I had. So Do ask I, and listen. Yes, dear. Tell them how you fix the mailbox during the rain. Hey, you know, you've, you've got to do what you got to do, you know. The rain comes, so you go drill holes in something. Or, you know, it's just little practical things that you picked up. Dad would have done this, and this is what I'm going to do. So, there you go. Oh, you're a boss. All right, our gospel lesson for today is found in the second chapter of Mark, and it's the 23rd verse, and then it goes through the third chapter, verse 6. So we're starting at Mark 2, 23. Jesus went through the wheat fields on the Sabbath. And as the disciples made their way, they were picking up the heads of wheat. The Pharisees said to the Jews, look, why are they breaking the Sabbath law? And Jesus said to them, Have you, haven't you ever read that when David, what David did when he was in need, when he and those with him were hungry, during the time when Abathar was high priest, David went into God's house and ate the bread of presence, which only the priests were allowed to eat. He also gave bread to those who were with him. And then he said, the Sabbath was created for humans. Humans weren't created for the Sabbath. This is why the human one is Lord even over the Sabbath. And then Jesus returned to the synagogue. A man with a withered hand was there wanting to bring charges against Jesus. They were watching Jesus closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. And he said to the man with the withered hand, step up when people can see you. And then he said to them, 
Is it legal on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil or to save a life or to kill? But they said nothing. Looking around at them with anger, deeply grieved at their unyielding hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he did, and his hand was made healthy. And at that, the Pharisees got together with supporters of Herod to plan how to destroy Jesus. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me now? Now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. In full disclosure, a lot of this sermon was borrowed. Uh, Ed Kilborn used to tell a story about taking a test and... During the test, he didn't know the answer to one of the questions, and he believed that God led him to look at the answer on someone else's test. So uh, I, I borrowed a lot of this. Actually, what it is is the majority of the main ideas were written by a man named Scott Hosey at Calvin Theological Seminary. Uh, I took a lot of them and made them work with this because uh, God led me that way. So anyway, just keep that in mind. Don't want to take full credit for a lot of the brilliant things that are in this. So, anyway. One thing that I shared with my father was a fascination, perhaps even a borderline obsession, with time. Between the two of us, at one point, I'm willing to bet that we had at least ten watches. I still own two of his watches today. One doesn't work, and one's the pocket watch that some days you'll see me wear on Sundays. Well, back in the 1970s, Texas Instruments developed the first watches with light-emitting diodes. You may remember these watches because they all had red digital lights which presented the time. Larry Banks has one on his wrist right now. I told you I was going to mention you in my sermon. Uh, So show it up. Show, Show it to everybody. Hold it up. There it is right there. So you guys might remember those watches. To some, our preoccupation with time would have seemed a little over the top. But when these watches first appeared, we became obsessed with their accurate timekeeping ability. Every Saturday afternoon, my father and I would gather in his bedroom, and he had a little shortwave radio receiver in there, and he'd tune in the correct frequency, and we'd set our watches to the exact hour, minute, and second to coordinate with then Greenwich Mean Time. And boy, they were accurate too. You still do it, don't you? No. Yeah. You don't have to do that every time. Oh, yeah? It goes for a year and keeps within 60 seconds a year. There you go. To be honest, I don't know what fueled our passion uh, with, with time. I'm willing to guess that it had something to do with my, my dad's love of science and astronomy. One of the first things that I remember learning from my father was that in the vastness of the heavens that God created, We don't measure the time from stellar worlds in miles. We measure it instead of the amount of time it takes light to travel one year at 186,000 miles per second, otherwise known as the speed of light. To put that into a number is quite easier to understand, but it's a huge number. Light travels the distance of 6 trillion miles in one year. Now, a person quite familiar with this concept was the physicist Albert Einstein. One of Einstein's greatest contributions to the world of physics had to do with time. There's an old saying, time marches on. You've heard that, right? Well, it was believed that time just ticked away at the same pace, no matter where a person was or what you were doing. Nothing you could do could affect time. If the watch... On my old Texas Instruments, uh, if the time on my old Texas Instruments watch started to run down, or the battery, I mean, the watch may not be as accurate. And it may lose its ability to maintain the correct time. But time itself kept passing by. You see, Einstein realized that time is truly an existing dimension. Time is as real as the wood on this pulpit. But it's not constant. Time is affected by motion and position. It's all relative. Now, Einstein had a classic illustration 
to demonstrate this. I want to picture, your, picture yourself riding on a train. And then picture somebody sitting beside the railroad tracks on a bench watching the train go by. Now, a bolt of lightning hits, actually two bolts of lightning hit, one in front of the train, one in back of the train, but they hit at the exact same instant. No difference in time, exact same instant, they strike the ground, they were simultaneous. But to the person riding 60 miles per hour on the train, he wouldn't perceive them hitting together at the exact same instance. On the train, you would see the bolt of lightning ahead of the train before the one that hits behind it. Even though the, you, uh, even though the lightning struck the tracks at the exact same instant. At one time, it was believed that this could be explained by the Doppler effect. Now, you might not know what the Doppler effect is, but you've all experienced it. There's no way you haven't experienced it. Let's say you're sitting in your car at, this, at the train crossing, and you hear a train coming, and you hear it whistle. You hear the whistle, and it goes, doot, 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 as it passes you. That's the Doppler effect. It's the sound waves move at a different rate as they get closer to you. So perhaps the same thing happens with lightning. You just get the light waves to one, of one bolt and you get to it quicker since you're moving toward it and away from the other one. But Einstein understood this was not the case because the speed of light is constant at 186,000 miles a second. Therefore, you can't arrive at the beam of light faster than the one in the back. Einstein realized that the reason the bolts appeared differently to the person on the train and the one on the bench was that the time is different for the person on the train. Time is relative. It can be affected by motion. Now, another scientific test involves two precise and sensitive nuclear clocks. Both of them synchronized to the exact second. You place one at the top of the Empire State Building and you place one at the base of the Empire State Building and then you walk away and leave them for a few days hoping no one in New York City will steal them. And then you come back and it turns out that the clock on the building, on the bottom of the building, runs slower than the clock at the top of the building because it is closer to the Earth's center of gravity than the one at the top, which moves faster as the Earth rotates. Now, something that Jews and Christians have understood all along about time is that it can affect us. But we can also affect the time around us. That's why God created a day of rest on the seventh day. Our God took care to weave a Sabbath of rest right into the quilt of his creation. My friends, maintaining a Sabbath is not just a human technique for stress reduction. It is a way to take hold of time and make it serve the cosmic purpose of glorifying God by paying attention to the rhythms that God created. And it's something that we can all share. It makes no difference if you're rich or you're poor or what. The Sabbath is there for all of us, but it's also there not just for people. The Bible says the donkey and ox also need a Sabbath day like the rest of us. Our staff, our employees, guests, our children, our friends, our land. Believe it or not, the land needs a Sabbath. In the Old Testament, every seventh year, the Old Testament tells us that we were supposed to give the soil a sabbatical year of rest and not plant in it. But in truth, most of us do a sorry job at taking the concept of Sabbath very seriously just as the Pharisees did so long ago. In our scripture today, Jesus and his disciples were walking through a field of grain on the Sabbath. And as Jesus moved along, some of the 12 disciples decided to eat a quick and healthy snack. I guess Funyuns weren't around back then. Anyway, they plucked some grain from the field and started to eat it as they walked along. Now they were observed doing so by some Pharisees, you know, those pious keepers of the law. Who told Jesus that it was harmful, unlawful, excuse me, for them to be plucking grain on the Sabbath, regardless of how hungry they were. For the Pharisees, their religion had deteriorated into rules, regulations, and rituals. 
These three R's became more important than mercy and kindness and certainly more important than serving other human beings in need. But Jesus knew the law better than anyone. He asked them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abathar was high priest and ate the bread of presence. Now, this was not lawful because the bread was preserved for priests only. Yet David took it and gave it to his companions. Look here. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, understand this. Jesus disagrees not because he regards the Sabbath commandments as something that have become trivial, because he sees The larger picture instead. One that regards the Sabbath in a totally different light. He turns to another piece of scripture. The story about David. To interpret. He roughly but not precisely summarizes 1 Samuel 21, 1-6. The story about David taking the consecrated bread that was supposed to be reserved for the priests. David did this because he was running from Saul. Who was trying to kill him. Now, Jesus implies that the priest did nothing wrong because the priest actually was there and gave him the bread. The priest did nothing wrong. He didn't break the strict letter of the law concerning the bread. But by remedying David's hunger, the priest sustained the life of a weary traveler and contributed to David's quest to live into his calling as the king appointed to replace Saul. Jesus, therefore, offers this legal opinion, one that he derives from Scripture itself. He contends that sometimes certain demands of the law are rightly set aside in favor of pursuing greater values or meeting greater needs, especially when those needs promote a person's well-being and facilitate the arrival of divine blessings. Later, Jesus and and his companions have made their way to Capernaum. And Jesus enters the synagogue and there's this man with a withered hand. Once again, the Pharisees were on hand to see what Jesus would do. You see, they knew Jesus well enough that they knew he could not resist the opportunity to heal someone, even if it was on the Sabbath. Now, perhaps the man just happened to be in the synagogue that day, or perhaps the Pharisees planted him there to entrap Jesus. It wasn't beyond them to do that thus providing them with the ammunition to remove him finally from their midst. I can just imagine the setup. Hey, Joseph, your hand's still crippled. Yeah, yeah, sorry to see that. Hey, why not let us pick you up and take you to church this Sunday? We really want you to be there. Maybe, maybe someone will be there to fix your hand. It was a big setup, and Jesus knew that, knew that. As he called the man to him and then he turned to the Pharisees and asked, Is it lawful to do good or harm on the Sabbath? To save or to kill? Well, the Pharisees remained silent. The rules they adhered to had become so important that even God dropped out of their sight. Not only that, but they failed to see with with compassion those among them who most needed God. Way back, these people who laid down these rules had the best of intentions, but it is in the nature of laws and rules that they take on a life of their own. And sooner or later, they have a way of sapping the joy and making people and their needs totally disappear from sight. And that's why Jesus wants to begin with God with creation and with each other. Jesus wants us to begin with love as he made clear that day in the synagogue. Jesus looked around him and stared at the Pharisees and he became angry. He was angered by their hardness of heart. He was angered by their hypocrisy, the ways by which these allegedly religious leaders co-opted God and God's word for their own purposes. It's in these times that we see Jesus' eyes flash And watch his temper rise. It was then that those who claimed to speak for God used their position to draw boundary lines of rigid inclusion and exclusion. That Jesus felt the blood rising in his face. Now by the way, this is the only time in scripture 
that the Gospels tell us that Jesus had anger. It's the first time the word is actually ever used in relation to Jesus. It takes a lot to get Jesus mad and petty arguments of the Pharisees just pressed his hot button. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He obeyed and immediately his hand was restored. We are told then that the Pharisees immediately left and began conspiring with the Herodians, those who followed Herod the king, to find a way to kill Jesus. Eugene Peterson, the man who gave us the message Bible, remarked one time that on Adam and Eve's very first day on earth in the Garden of Eden, it was a Sabbath day. It's true. We all began life with a day off. God did this to remind us that we were made in love and for love. The Sabbath day was not just a day for resting our weary bones and ceasing all work. That command to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy was not in order to stop loving, to stop caring, which is exactly the way the Pharisees made it seem. And not only had they dishonored the Sabbath by making it so joyless, they took a day dedicated to love and our Father, and these keepers of the Torah, they began plotting the murder of God's only Son. Now, do you think that was lawful on the Sabbath? These men who had it all but lacked the one thing that the Apostle Paul later wrote about in 1 Corinthians 13. If I have love that can move mountains, I mean, if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. The Pharisees are nothing. They, they were filled with fury against Jesus because he violated all their interpretations of the Old Testament. And Jesus also claimed that he was Lord of the Sabbath, equating himself with God, which to them was blasphemy. The scene in the synagogue intensifies the conflict over Jesus' authority, his values, and the urgency of his claims. For the Pharisees who lie in wait watching, the issue is not whether Jesus has the power to heal the man's hand. It is whether doing so on the Sabbath demonstrates a willful disregard for the law of God, a law that was believed to give good order to life and to provide conditions for encountering God's blessings and holiness. But Jesus' response to the Pharisees points out that Jesus is not breaking the law in any way because nothing he does can be considered work, but simply acts of love. As God intended to be expressed on the Sabbath, Jesus' main objective is to save and preserve life. What better way, what better day to do that on than the Sabbath? Now, some of you might say, but preacher Jim, the man Jesus healed wasn't dying. He just had a crippled hand. Well, you'd be right. Totally. At least in terms of a physical death. But how about a spiritual death? You see, this crippled man would have been an outcast in his own society. He was unable to work, unable to provide for his family. In healing this man, Jesus did more than simply perform a miracle. He not only restored the man's useless hand, he probably restored the man's ability to earn a living, restored him to the whole community, restored him to his family and friends, and to live a life of happiness. Jesus didn't just heal the hand, he healed the whole man. And brothers and sisters, this is a lesson that we all must learn and take to heart, especially in the coming months as United Methodists and especially in the coming weeks when we begin to hear news reports about our denomination and how our denomination feels fit to include its leadership, who they want to include in the leadership and among the own members of its congregations. It's important for us to understand as followers of Jesus Christ, as the scripture so poignantly points out, how religious commitments and values can harden the hearts, like the hearts of the Pharisees, and turn oppressive in the hands of careless stewards. And none of us are immune to this. 
<coughs> However, going down the road, the cross should remind us all of how easily the most noble motives can be perverted and how quickly an institution can stifle legitimate concerns of those outside that may seem to threaten its own stability. It illustrates how frequently insidious force, forces we scarcely notice can transform the best educated, best intentioned among us all into insensitive leaders desperately out of touch with what's real. So keep that in mind in the next few weeks and months. Time may seemingly pass us by. But there is one true constant in life. God. God never changes. And neither does his love for his creation. Amen. Amen. The altar is open for anyone who would like to come up and spend a moment in prayer. Also, one of the things I forgot to mention was we will have Sunday school following worship today to give the ladies more time to prepare, and Brenda will be in here to teach. So. But the altar is now open. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.